Well, welcome to the Stargate to the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, riding a bicycle on flames is Matt Brandenburg. Yeah, I love this bike. It's like Pee Wee's Herman. <laughs> Pee Wee Her- Pee Wee's Herman. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. And looking on in horror is Vitla May Mist. Hey, y'all. <laughs> I don't know why I said Pee Wee's Herman. I mean, I was... what, 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 am I supposed to scream <laughs> into the abyss or? Yes. What? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to scream. <laughs> Today we're going to be discussing Criterion by Tyler Jones. And yeah, get ready for a depressing. Soft... Yeah, I, I read that one too, yes. Okay, we can touch on Edra softly then too. So get ready to be depressed. Oh yes, depressed and 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 taught a valuable lesson about addiction. Yes, <laughs> and not like addiction and after yes, school special Mike, way. Or as my, like yeah, exactly. That's what Mike wants us to put in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike is not like with after us. School special. He did not <laughs> like this very much. I don't think. Rest in peace, Mike. He just thought it was meh. Yeah, yeah. that's, a, that's about it. all he said. I personally loved it. I thought. I thought. This was great, and I thought Andrew Softly was a wonderful companion piece to the story. I have some opinions on this, but we'll, yeah. we can get into it. <laughs> we'll get into it in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But no, I'm, I'm always, I think even if it's not like a five out of five to you, Tyler Jones is such a great writer that like, it's just, it's yeah. still like enjoyable to read. Well, it's heavy, but his prose yes. is always it's, enjoyable. Yeah, yes. he can. Build a story and get you hooked on characters, uh, for sure. I just that and there's some thoughts that we'll we'll get into later that like I I'm in between. I'll say I I'm not as be- as Mike Mike thinking this is an after school special. I'm not that level yet, but I'm I do have some I just some thoughts about some things that I was kind of like yeah, understandable. Yeah, so. But we well, can get to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean that's why we're that's why we're here. Exactly. exactly. We're here to talk about these things, and it'll be it'll be dumb if we all agreed that like this is all amazing. Yeah, that yeah. only happens for certain things. Yeah, but before yes. we dive into that, I think it's good <laughs> to give a rundown of some stuff we've been going over this last week. I think and so. Have you guys been watching Peacemaker at all? No, yes. we've I've been stuck in Archive eighty one. So Archive eighty one. I'm, I'm on Archive eighty one too. But uh, how I is finished Peacemaker? Archive eighty one. I did too. Well, I I finished I finished Archive eighty one. I haven't finished, and it. I really enjoy it. I'm on yes. episode seven of Archive eighty one. You're close. Yeah, I think it's I'm about close. eight or nine episodes. I will say to fans of the podcast, if you're listening, I highly recommend Archive eighty one. It requires a lot of attention. Yes. So you yeah. need to be giving the show like it's not one of those shows you can like spend a minute looking on like your phone and then going back to the show like you need to pay full attention to the show when you're oh. watching it. Yeah, it's tricky. And it's it's kind of completely rewarding when you're doing that. Yes, yeah. that's yeah, that's what I was thinking that and like it's tricky, too, because they'll bring up like a character or a name from like two episodes ago. And if you were wa- we watched it like just one episode a night so it was kind of like trying to remember who they were bringing up and be like i think it's so and so um so yeah you definitely have to pay attention definitely but no i think it's a really rewarding like series to watch and it's really intense but peacemaker i love peacemaker so it's still good it's so funny it's (laughs) it's hilarious i've only watched the first four episodes so i haven't gone further than that but you know I think I think we covered it in the last episode, but you know, just watching the intro is so fucking worth it. <laughs> the intro is so funny. Yeah, the, the intro is the intro is amazing. The the show itself is really funny. And I'm actually kind of I'm kind of bummed out that I haven't seen you know because I'm I'm pretty active on Twitter uh, on TikTok, and I'm pretty bummed that people aren't dancing to that and making yeah. TikTok you know, videos with that with that dance. That is crazy. You think they would? I just want to see that because it's so funny. Yeah. Maybe it's because you know. Maybe it's because everyone in in the intro, everyone is like, it has this deadpan faces, and people probably can't do that while they're doing the dances <laughs> without being maybe a professional actor or something. Right. So yeah, I usually when I'm watching you know shows, I usually I tend to you know skip the intros because you know it gets a little bit tedious from time to time. But <laughs> this is one of the few times when I'm like, nope. 
Nope, we're not skipping that. I'm going to watch that dance and be happy. <laughs> Episode episode the episode four was kind of slow, but it was very character driven. So it got us to know the characters a bit more, and I appreciated yes, that. And it, it still had some really funny moments, like yeah. Lanty talking to the, yeah, the yes. uh, white supremacist in prison was hilarious. Vigilante is so funny. He's so <laughs> funny, and it's like it's like uh, the DC version of Deadpool almost. And I'm like, okay, I see what you're going there, but it's not as good as Ryan Reynolds. But I like the dude. <laughs> And he's insane, <laughs> so all right. So what? What's like? I I've only seen the first episode. What? What's up to four? Because I don't want to spoil. I don't know how far they are along. But like, what's the basic now. premise? I'd say the basic premise is they uh, basically are trying to fight off against an alien invasion, pretty much. But there's yeah. more that goes into it that gets very spoilery. Okay. Like really, all it is to with without spoiling, yeah. Yeah. they are trying to track down these aliens called butterflies, which are butterfly looking creatures that enter through people's orifices. Oh God. Over their bodies. Oh God. <laughs> of course it's the orifices. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so think the nest, but uh, yeah, so think the nest, but you know, <laughs> with butterflies and in a, in a gimmicky kind of way, you know, a la James Gunn. Oh yeah. God. <laughs> Oh man! As the Simpsons say, no one ever suspe- uh, su- uh, suspects the butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's very um, it still keeps up like yep. the shocking value of the movie Suicide Squad, and Excellent. it still keeps up like I don't think it's as gory as the movie was, but it still has some shocking moments of violence and stuff. The no. action's well done. the The humor is great. Yes, like John mm-hmm. Cena is hilarious. Yes. That's he says awesome. a big man child. <laughs> I, know, he, I love him. I love him so much. He's so funny. I was just gonna okay. say it's it's, it's so just so so funny to watch him. It's just and he and he and he always like has these looks. You know, he has these deadpan looks, and you just like, are you trying to be serious? And then he just looks at you like, oh shit, you're trying to be serious. Okay, <laughs> I don't know if I should laugh or be terrified. <laughs> Well, and I think it's funny, too, because, you know, in Fast 9, he was in that and he just it didn't he I don't think he worked really well on that. He just couldn't play like because we knew he's funny having seen Suicide Squad before that before Fast 9. And so you're kind of like, man, what they made him so serious in that movie. And I'm happy to hear that they're letting him be goofy again in Peacemaker. He has a serious moments in Peacemaker, too, but I think it works with if you guess. Yes. It works with the character because the character is a huge man child. <laughs> but he has this like he does have his serious moments too. Cool. But it, it but <laughs> if you guys have seen the movie Sisters, uh the one with um Tina Fey and Amy can't remember her name. The one Polar. who plays in Parks and Rec. Yeah. Um yes, Amy Poehler, there we go. Uh, he plays a part in that movie. Oh, uh, does he? And he plays this huge muscled uh drug dealer. Yeah, like a drug dealer. And he, the entire time, he still he has that deadpan look. He doesn't break into a smile at all. And he is hilarious. I, he, yeah. If, 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 if you know, if Tina Fey or Amy Poehler weren't in that movie, I think he probably would have saved it. <laughs> <laughs> he's also... But he's, it's so funny. Um, There's also in a movie... So, like, I remember when he first tried to get into acting... And he did, like, really bad action movies. It was terrible in them. So I kind of wrote John Cena off as, like, okay, he was a really good wrestler, but he can't break into acting. And then um, Trainwreck came out, the Amy Schumer movie. Yeah. And he has a small role in that movie. And Mm -hmm. he's fucking hilarious. (laughs) He is so... He saves that whole movie. Like, his, like, six minutes of screen time in that movie, funniest parts in the movie. (laughs) Awesome. Like they're like, That's right. like I, if you manage to get like really good directors who understand that he has humor, then he you know the magic comes forth if if he finds good directors who do that. What was it in train wreck? There's a really funny scene yes. in the movie theater. You've seen it, right? I think so, yeah. When like uh the guy's yelling at Amy Amy Schumer and John Cena in the theater, and John Cena's like, I will fuck you in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. 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 I remember that. It was hilarious. 
<laughs> I mean, wow. Like, the thing is, John Cena is really good in comedies. And yeah. like, he could succeed in an action role if like yes. he has the right director. But his comedy work is is fantastic. But That's um, awesome. But Matt, what about yes. you? Yeah. So like I said, we finished Archive 81. It's funny. I keep wanting to call it Artifact 81. And then I have to catch myself and say it's not Artifact 81. It's Archive 81. <laughs> um, I won't get into too many spoilers just because it is fairly new and we are kind of on time now with our episodes. But it's really good. Uh, I do think the ending the last episode, I had some minor issues with it nothing major and didn't like ruin the show for me i just there was a couple parts where i was like yeah um but i like the way they ended it and i'm really hoping and i think other people have said this too but i'm really hoping they uh continue on with this story i think the podcast is a little bit more of a um anthology so i don't know what they're planning with this show and it's Netflix. So you never know what they're going to do. Um, if they're going to go long term or if they're just going to stop something in the middle of it, that's not Mike Flanagan, but, uh, let's see. I have a couple things. I, I think the main one I want to talk about is, uh, Christy Nogle's, um, debut, which is Balua. I think it, that's how it's pronounced. Um, if it's not, I apologize, but it's like B-E-A-L-U-H or something like that. Anyway, uh, Cemetery Gates Media put this out or publishing, mm-hmm. and it is basically, it's it's this uh, mother and three daughters from like 18 to I think like nine or 10 in ages, and they move into this town, Balua, which was uh, their mom's like, I don't want to say hometown, maybe it was hometown, but longest town she lived in. This family moves around a lot, so they're not like, they never have a set place, but they're hoping Balua will be that place. They're going to fix up this school house to sell it, and the oldest daughter can see ghosts. And she has this sense of like, she's a little flighty. And I can't tell if that's due to the ghost seeing or just that's her style. She kind of gets lost in her thoughts. And so it's first person. We're we're following her thoughts. So it just seems normal to us. And then the characters are like, hey, where'd you go for the last like 15 minutes? We've been talking to you. So it's really interesting with that and just how she sees these ghosts just kind of repeating events. She can't totally interact with them. A lot of them. There's some that she does interact with. Uh, there's this isn't really a spoiler, but there's like a, she's talking about this time in school where she met these three boys and they were really hitting it off as friends. And it took her a while to realize they were actually ghosts. And so no one really noticed that. But some stuff happened between these ghosts and her that were kind of scared people away. And there's some big event as of where I'm at now, which is about halfway through that happened that has a lot of has the family kind of questioning this the main character and, and and what like what her deal is so it's it's written really well it's very um i don't know, subtle horror you know it, it there's some very little scary bits it's just you can tell there's this like ominous dread through the whole thing of something is gonna happen uh there's somebody in this schoolhouse this ghost in a schoolhouse that doesn't seem uh on the up and up and so she's trying to figure that out uh, as well as just tried to like manage being in this new town and seeing ghosts and being a little weird it's super good i you know it just came out this as of this recording it's probably been out a week and i'm hoping it gets a lot of buzz because i think it's a really cool uh book and yeah i think uh I, I've read some of Christie's stuff in some like anthologies and everything like that. And she's an amazing writer. And so I'm hoping this gets a lot of good praise as time goes on. So that's a uh, Balua by Christy Nogle. That sounds awesome. Yeah. It, it's super good. Nice. It's yeah. It's, it's like it's a, a slow, slow burn horror. Yeah, exactly. Like she gives us these little hints about like ghosts wanting to come into your body she said, well, you got to be careful with that because when these ghosts come in, they might want to just stay in and you're popped out. And so you can't get back in. And 
she referenced at the very beginning that it's happened two or three times. We haven't seen them yet. It seems like she's telling us the story after the fact. So you're kind of worried about that. And, and you know something happened because of just some of these really subtle hints. Uh, but yeah, it's super good. That sounds great. I just got it from uh, Kindle Unlimited. So I'll give it a beat. I'll be giving it a read soon. Yes, definitely. It's it's good. I think it's a good kickoff for Women in Horror Month. So perfect. And Vitlame, what about you? Uh, well, I like Mad. I finished uh, Archive Eighty One, and like Mad, I <laughs> I enjoyed it as well. Uh, I feel I have this. I have the same kind of feelings regarding the the last couple of episodes. Uh, they I can't say that it dragged a little bit, but it was like it's not. It wasn't as much you know, edge of your seat, kind of like, I need to know what the fuck is happening, kind <laughs> yeah. of thing. But I really enjoyed the the acting. The acting yes. was really, really good. Um, all of the actors were good. Um, and, I, and I really hope that they're going to pick up where they left off, hopefully soon, maybe in, by next year or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's gotten great reviews so far, so I can't see why not. We tried, I can't, we're going to continue with it, but we we saw that on Disney Plus they had released a series called Hit Monkey. Yeah. <laughs> that's, on, uh, that's on Hulu for us here in the States. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, so we watched the first episode, uh, didn't know what the fuck we were watching. <laughs> it's really weird. Not, I mean, I didn't, didn't really mind the, you know, the monkey being a hitman part. I mean, that's like, yeah, I mean, it's based from a, based on a comic book. <laughs> what else is new? Yeah. Um, what really threw me off though, was that the first episode starts in, um, starts in Japan and the hitman is actually a human guy who's like a well-known hitman. And, you know, he's been assigned to assassinate this kind of politician, like, um, kind of like a progressive politician who's tried to bring change to the Japanese um, citizens and everything like that, which is fine. Doesn't happen often, I must admit. But the thing that kind of threw me off was the the one, uh, the, the, there was this Japanese reporter, I think, who is played by Olivia Munn. I have nothing against Olivia Munn. She was, she was okay. But her portrayal of the character, culturally speaking, was not correct, in my opinion. Yeah, it's like I agree she with was that. really upbeat. She like talked back to she she talked back to you know the the her higher ups and uh, you know was really spontaneous. And I I feel like okay, yeah, if you if you had lived somewhere else in the states or something, if you'd been like a, an exchange student and you've gotten a taste of how individualism works, then yes, that probably worked. But given that her name. Uh, you know, it's Akiko and everything, and it was like in a Japanese setting. I'm like, no, she wouldn't have done that. She would have been meek as fuck. Yes. Yeah. And submissive and, you know, not talking back to her superiors and everything. So that threw me off. I'm like, oh, is this going to be like the rest of the series? I'm probably not going to enjoy it because it's going <laughs> to fuck me the entire time. <laughs> yeah. I, ho I hear the series is quite good. I haven't seen it myself, it's... but I've heard lots of good things about it. I mean, the, the drawing style is, is, you know, it's good. It kind of, it had kind of like these kind of an Archer-esque style a little bit. Yes, I was thinking uh, but, that too. you know, too. the lines of the, how the characters were drawn, they're not as bold, but it was kind of in that kind of like format kind of, I would describe it, I guess, which is, yeah, I mean, you don't see a lot of that in, on TV nowadays. So, I mean, it was a nice, nice add to it. But I don't know. I might give the second episode a, a shot. Yeah, I watched. I also I was gonna, uh, started. I was going to say. Oh, sorry. I also started watching. I was going to say. I, I... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You go on. See? This, got, this, this goddamn delay. Um, I, we also started watching this new uh, South Korean series that's on Netflix. I think it's called one? They Will All Die. I mean, it's called We Are All Yeah, the zombie dead. one. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all very dead. Okay, yeah. Uh, I watched the we watched the first episode of that yesterday, and uh, I mean, compared to other zombie shows that we've seen from South Korea, it's not as great, but it's 
kind of fun though. It's like it's goofy. It's like it's kind of ridiculous. You know, it happens at at a like a high school, and it's a huge fucking high school. I think I saw like in the episode. I think I saw around maybe 100, 200 students. And I'm like, shit, that's a lot. <laughs> All wearing the same uniforms and everything. I'm like, oof. You're, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to you know see which is which which character is which. I said I'm sorry that probably sounded racist. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it sounds it looks fun and I I I really want to see like how it's gonna progress because apparently a school teacher like a like a high school science teacher he brought forth this kind of zombie virus and I'm like how the fuck did you do that <laughs> like in in the classroom he's been like de- like he's been developing in that and i'm like okay sure on high school salary sure <laughs> <laughs> especially in south korea i'm like nope nope that's that that ain't fucking happening <laughs> So I'm I'm interested to see how like how far it's gonna go like if it's gonna be like super gnarly or or if it's gonna focus on the characters or not like the first episode was kind of focusing on the characters giving you a brief like who they were and stuff and the interaction was kind of funny it was like you know kind of like a a high school drama a little bit but I enjoyed it and uh, I'm probably gonna finish the rest and see how it is yeah I might ch- I might check that one out. I've I've seen it advertised, so and I always tend to enjoy South Korean stuff. I figure give it a go would be yeah, a good. Yeah, me too. But one last thing for me, yeah, is I'm in the middle of a really fantastic book I'll be talking about very soon called When the Reckoning Comes by Latanya by Latanya McQueen. It is her first novel, and it's one of the best debuts I've ever read. It's about this woman named Mira who. When she was younger, something happened on a former plantation grounds in her hometown, and she suffered a traumatic experience from it. And this deals with her having to return to the town for a plantation wedding at those same grounds and kind of the effects of slavery in the area and how it's kind of bled into the ground and still affects the area in the modern day. Crazy. And it's it's really well Interesting. done. Like, I, I, I love it. But I'll have more to say on that once I finish it. And I am also started reading Slash Her, the woman-centric horror anthology. Nice. How are you liking that? Oh, Ooh. I'm loving it. It's edited by Janine Pipe and Jill Dr- uh, Giandri. And it's put out by Kadisha's, wom- Kadisha's Press. And it has the table of contents is stacked. You got uh, Summer Cannon, Laurel Hightower, R.J. Joseph, Kenny Jennings, Kenzie Jennings, uh, Vit LeMay, you're, on, <laughs> you're in this anthology as well. Yep. Steen Morgan. <laughs> yep, yep. Like, the, it's a great lineup. I've only read up to um, Laurel's stories so far, and I've loved all of them. I love how natural you are with that, Vit May. You're just like, yeah, yep. it's been getting It's been getting good for you so far. So. I mean, what else am I supposed to be? <laughs> am I supposed to be like, yeah, yeah, read mine. Mine's the best. <laughs> I'll save I'll save yours for last, just to keep you on suspense. Oh but my god! <laughs> yes, please do that. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> I say we should turn this over to the after school special part of the podcast. What do you guys think? <laughs> yes, I agree. All right, Criterium is kind of the best way I could describe Criterium is it's about a teenage boy named Zach whose father was found burnt beyond recognition after walking out in his family and Zach is following in his father's footsteps with now seems to be a crippling drug addiction and he finds a bicycle that takes him on the ride for quite literally his life yeah that's pretty it's pretty much the gist of it right there yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah definitely I'm a little bit confused though um uh, the about the is it is it a just a regular bicycle or is it a bike so i wasn't sure when i was listening to the audiobook i'm was like can't re-, because he has he has his feet on the pedals and i'm like okay but there are also and i say this with quote, air quotes because you guys can't see it pedals on like motorcycles and i'm like is it a that or is it a just a regular bicycle like a kid's bicycle i think it's just a kid's bicycle however 
I will a put racing bicycle like like a, a bicycle that's a pedal bicycle that's designed for racing. Yeah, and what else? Give the caveat to on that is the way Tyler Jones describes it. It sounds like it's like a hacked to uh, uh, hacked together is the wrong word. It's like a customized bike. There's a lot of different parts in there. So you know, and, and, and he yeah. describes uh, he describes at one point hearing a. I mean, like throughout the whole thing, he's been kind of hearing a sound, but he thinks that there might be something in the body of the bike. So who knows? I guess the bigger question is, was I think his dad was riding the bike, too? Yes. OK. It's the same bike that his dad. Yeah. His yeah. Dad- yeah. Because I yeah, it, because I yeah, I, I was a little bit confused whether, you know, his dad's death had been like a natural one or supernatural one. Yeah. Well, and then it's what's interesting because uh, I guess they he does. So spoilers, I guess, uh, <laughs> because well, maybe not total spoilers. We'll get to that soon. But there is a character at the end of the story also seen on the bike. So that leads you to believe that bike is like a ferryman taking you somewhere. However, if you read the second sort of novella in this it that character does not ride a bike but still ends up at this gray house so i i'm not sure what the significance of this bike is and if it's always the bike that takes somebody there or if it's something else i I think the house chooses it might just come forth as the person yeah yeah i think so i think it chooses how it will lure you to the house. That makes sense. And in, in the case of uh, Zach and his dad, uh, it was, you know, because they needed to find something to sell in order to buy more drugs. And, you know, a custom bike uh, sounds like a really sweet deal to, you know, to have, to yes put on to a, you know, bike shop or something like that. Yeah. And I guess we do get a reference to uh, um, like a, uh, like a, uh, I don't know, pawn shop that Zach was going to go to with this bike. So that makes sense. Yeah, um, because he's been, he, yeah, because he's been there before. He, he, I think he went there when he sold his own bike. Yeah. You know, to, to get more money for his drug addiction. Yes, definitely. So this book, <laughs> especially the first story, so Criterium, is extremely depressing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For all, for all you listeners who are thinking, uh, listen to our last episode about Mike Sisko's member. This is not the same. <laughs> we're not we're not going to be having a lot of fun with this one. No, this one's just sad. Like it's yes. sad, it's dreary. It's, no, it's unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, because like the Zach yeah. lives with his mom and sister, and because the dad, like we've already established and is established at the very beginning of the book the dad passed away and so the mom's working long hours you got zach that's supposed to watch the sister but zach like we said is addicted to pills and um yeah it's extremely sad to watch this little girl like sister deal with this and her trying her hardest to be you know good at the same time zach is trying you know, we get internal through Zach's thoughts. He he doesn't want to, as most addicts don't want to be addicted. And he wants to be there for his mom and he wants to be there for his sister. But the pain is so much that he then falls back on the pills. So, like, it's I halfway through was like it was rough because you just feel so bad. This little girl is trying her hardest and she's singing in a room and like. Uh, you get like enough views of this and you're seeing it through this drug addled haze of Zach. And you're just like, Oh man, dude, you, I, uh, it's, it's tough. (laughs) Yeah. And it makes it hard. Especially when you, when you consider the fact that Zach is only a teenager. Yes. He's just a teenager and he's already like really addicted to morphine. And I'm like, shit, that is really bad. Yeah. I mean, we had the Mike's criticism said it felt like an after school special. <laughs> well, like, an after school special is like the father finds a shoebox of, mar- shoebox of marijuana and yeah. takes his son down to the room. And it's like, son, explain this. And the kid <laughs> just goes, I learned it from watching you, Dad. <laughs> true. Yes, that's true. 
Like, that's an yeah. after school special. This this felt more empathetic towards like addiction itself and like what yeah. can cause addiction. Yeah. Or after school special will be like, drugs are bad, so don't do drugs. This like yeah. shows us why the kid did what he what he's doing and how he's trying to stop, but he can't. And it's approaching yes. it with a very empathetic like approach, I felt. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I, definitely. I mean, you can also see kind of the trigger of why he'd start taking drugs. I mean, it just, it wasn't really to, you know, to literally, you know, follow his dad's footsteps. It's, I mean, the poor kid saw his father die in flames. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how the fuck can you recover from that without proper help? And the only thing, you know, because they're poor, uh, so he, that's the only thing that he can actually reach out for it are the drugs. I mean, he doesn't want to, but it's the only thing that can really, you know, uh, soften his pain, so to speak. Yeah, Tyler, he does a great job capturing that because, like I said, you see it, like you see in his mind, he doesn't want to do this, but then his mind p- pulls him back down to seeing all the trouble his dad caused and the pain that his mom's in and the pain that his sister's in, and he wants an escape and that's his escape is those pills. He doesn't want to do it, but he, you know, he, there's a couple of spots before he gets to the bike where he's really like, I'm going to clean up. I don't want, you know, I'm going to be better. My sister caught me, you know, cl- crawling into the room, passed out on the floor. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be better. But then you know, the mind's a terrible thing and it plays terrible tricks on you. And he's like, my only escape from this pain is just one more pill and then I'll feel better. And so like, yeah, it, that yeah, he also, yeah. Well, he also shows, like you were saying that, you know, he's showing it that he wants to get better through his sister, but he also is um, showing it through, you know, the past things that used to make him happy, like basketball, you know, he as is on his ass. He's on his way to get his next fix. He's, he walks past like this pe- uh, these kids playing basketball and he just, you know, goes into his mind like, oh, yeah, that's one of the things that I really used to, do, used to love doing. I could go back and do it. But then the pull for, you know, and the pain, because the reason he really liked going uh, doing basketball was for, his, you know, for his father to get proud to be proud of him. Uh, but then after his dad left and he didn't go and see any of his basketballs basketball games it kind of just you know the purpose of feeling happy of doing that is kind of left out the window and that's why the pull for the next fix is a little stronger than his you know nostalgic memories yeah definitely and it you get you see not only that with the basketball game but there's other times he's remembering his dad you know flaking out or the fights and everything like that and in fact oh man the beginning of the book you have he he can yep. hear his he can hear his mom and dad fighting and then he hears his sister crying and so he goes in there and is trying to calm her down and man just so if talking last week talking to Chad Lutsky and we know he's does a lot of emotional stuff even though he said he doesn't want he didn't want to be pigeonholed but he does Tyler man he gave him a run for his money with this one because it for my cold robot heart, it's still he, cracked. He, yeah, it definitely felt uh, really real, and you know, especially the part you know when they're going inside and people are fight and the parents are fighting. I just went back to my childhood when my parents used to fight. I'm like, oh, I feel so bad. Like this is bringing out really, really not so good memories here. <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, we have we haven't really we haven't really discussed we haven't discussed this before, but you know he uh, Tyler has also written a novel called Almost Truth, and I covered it, um, I recommended it uh, in our last episode. But he's just really good at these tragedies. Uh, there's this part in Almost Ruth. I'm not going to spoil anything about what happened, but just the descriptions of how that person is going through in this grief, I had to skip it because I didn't want to be bawling my eyes out while I was reading it. I was like, <laughs> I was like, my mind went to really dark places during that part. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Happy things, happy thoughts. I had to go back. So I had to skip it. 
<laughs> oh man. But I'm, but I'm sure it was really great. But at the same time, I'm like, no, I don't want to be sad. I don't want to cry. I cried enough. I cried enough when I was in Washington. Don't look up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's really good. I, I think we can get into a, a little spoil, spoil, spoil talk. So he, uh, Zach, wants to, he needs money because he wants to get a pill. Um, he goes and visits his drug dealer who lives in this really crazy, it's like a rundown apartment building, but his room is, or this guy, the, I can't remember the drug dealer's name. It's like Wizard or something like that. He, Hazard. Uh, Hazard. Hazard, yes. So Hazard, uh, his apartment within this crappy bit complex is super nice. And and he, surprising, like, I can't, when did this, I'm not sure when Criterium came out. When did this originally get published? Last year, or 2020, I think. Okay. So thinking about that. Yeah, he probably, okay, so he probably wrote it in, like, 2019. Hazard wears a mask because he does not want to get any germs or sickness. And I was like, wow, that's a little <laughs> like on the topic. So anyway, he's like a very interesting character, Hazard. We only get him for a little bit and then maybe a little bit more at the end. But of course, Zach has no money. Hazard says, well, don't come here again without money. And so that's when Zach finds this bike and hatches this plan. And so then he hops on the bike planning to sell it. Uh, but then the bike takes control and just starts steering him and pedaling him. And this is really intense. And this is where I'm wondering if where Mike might have thought, because I started to have a little trouble with this bike being such a um, such. And I don't mean to be mean. We've been pl praising Tyler a lot, but this bike seemed very uh, obvious metaphor for a tr for falling down drug habit. Um, yeah. And it, it got a little mm -hmm. like over yeah. the top. <laughs> so that's that's my biggest complaint was he's riding this bike and this bike is controlling him, just like how drugs control people or addiction controls people. And he's trying to get off, but the bike won't let him get off. And in fact, the bike even starts harming him. And you're like, OK, and where is it taking him to? But to the drug house where he's going to end his life. Um, so I. I as everything else I really liked, but after a while I was like, okay, I get this obvious uh, metaphor and this is kind of tiring. It's as obvious as the uh, South Park chase the dragon metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, it, it's very scary and it's done very well. Um, you know, he can't get off the spike as much as he tries to fall or steer it. It even lets him steer every once in a while, uh, but then it takes him right back. And, and there's a very intense scene with a truck. I did like that a lot. I thought that was cool. But you do, yeah, you, you are kind of stuck whether it, it you're kind of thinking, you know, is, is this all happening in his mind or not? But then we kind of get like this small little chapter about a little boy named Simon who's yeah. wanting... <laughs> Was wanting to uh, do, he was gonna do like a, a really scary snowman monster because his mom kicked him out uh, to play outside instead of playing video games. And he sees Zach on the bike and he sees him, you know, being kind of stuck to it and he's so, and he's still hurt and there's blood everywhere. And you kind of like, so, okay, so this bike is real, maybe? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and I like that exactly what you said, putting that in there, because that does give us that kind of real thing. But then the, the flip side is the cop that looks sort of like a bug. I was trying to figure out what mm -hmm. that was all about. My, might be his, you know, just his perception of, you know, if he gets caught, he's going to die. So he's kind of depicting this kind of monster uh, form of the from the, of the cops because you know drugs are bad and if you meet a cop well you know having drugs you might get killed yeah yeah, yeah. i mean That's... like i also feel the um it's hard to write a drug story without being like hey drugs can actually be very dangerous yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is very true and like you know it's uh, it's not a bad thing i've not saying like that ruined the book or anything i'm not and i'm not on mike's full path of just not liking this I, <laughs> and it's funny because he's not here to defend himself so nope. <laughs> <laughs> was here he could have told us his edible story 
<laughs> right? That that popped into my head immediately. <laughs> um. So like, I, I'm not bashing that, and like, I get, you know, it. it you you kind of have to do what you got to do for it. it. It just it it did pull me out a little bit where I was kind of like, all right, I get what we're doing. Uh, but I liked all the other stuff too. Um, and it, and it's, again, it's an intense bike ride. I mean, like, cause he can't stop pedaling. And at one point, like he hits his, le- the bike almost breaks his leg. And so like, we're getting this gross, like bone rubbing as mm-hmm. the pedals keep going. I did and like, the, and the, and the, and the, uh, the skin flapping like an open mouth. I was like, oh, yes. Ah. <laughs> yes. Which, yeah. Yeah. One thing I like, though, is how we were able to see kind of Zach's perseverance, too. Yes. Which You're I thought right. was like, I don't know, I felt Zach was very humanized, but like throughout a lot of the story. Oh, totally. Oh, I yeah, you definitely empathized with him. Yes. And because I mean, like, and that's the thing, like, I, I mean, everyone, you know, with addiction and with especially this character and what Tyler was trying, I think, trying to go for. I mean, like, we didn't want that, like you said, after school special or those like early visions of people addicted to stuff. And they're just like terrible people, apparently, that we don't like. He wants to be better. He wants to get off this bike. Uh, he just can't. And so you're like they're with him and you're rooting for him through the whole thing. And, you know, you just, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> so, so it's done really well. You want him off that bike. Even if the bike is a huge metaphor, you're still like, man, this is not good. <laughs> you got to get off of it, man. And the, the house. So like, I love that. So there's this house for listeners that's in this crappy part of town. And we get, again, at the beginning, we kind of get, we are following the story from this old man who lives across the street and he watches people go into this house. He's called the cops on this house. He knows it's not a good one. He sees um, people like stumbling around it. He sees people entering the house and not leaving. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's like this, like you just know this is house is up to no good. And even like Tyler describes, it, it's got a tree that looks like lightning had crashed it and, and killed it. And so it's like this gnarly tree and there's mold and there's, there, it's just this nasty looking house. And that's where his da- Zach's dad would go to. Everyone knew about this house. And so they knew his dad was always going there. And it's the one ha- like area Zach state wanted to stay away from not only because he's the burn spot from his father but just because he knew he's like i'm on pills but i'm not gonna be on heroin uh, um so you know but of course the bike is taking him to this creepy house and, and it's just just like terrible it, like and while that's happening the cops are there and the cops are after him the weird bug cop is after him it's just just like awesome like kind of finale climax scene yeah i agree so i agree too it, yeah i, I also you know. liked yeah, i also liked at the end uh you know when he is kind of between life and death uh i i really enjoyed that scene and how tyler managed to uh, you know convey it you know with sex soul being this kind of like a million pieces of like silver sand i i enjoyed that one yeah yeah, that was super cool. Like, it, yeah, it's like the sand and it's all memories. And then there's like spaces or there's like black parts of the memory that I think are the drug parts. And it's just, yeah, it's done really well. And the fact that like he's seeing like he sees these two windows and you realize like it's in his head. It, it's it, yeah, he did a really good job with that. Yeah, you could definitely <laughs> you could you could definitely, you know, visualize it in your in your head like if it, if it had been like done into a movie you it kind of felt like the interstellar part yeah yeah i could see that yeah it's... but what also really killed me was at that scene um uh, when he hears these wailings like uh, like way like in the distance and he hears his dad wailing and i'm like oh, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> that was like the nail to the coffin i'm like oh yeah. he's never gonna he's never gonna see his dad again <laughs> yes well on that whole part yeah you know again 
you might listeners if you want to read this and you should you can skip ahead a couple minutes because that whole part where he's kind of like in hell was terrifying and he's like yeah your dad's here just go down this road and you'll find him it was just yeah. like oh god so i think was, it was i don't know i feel this is one of the better horror books that i've read in a while too yeah like, i just love tyler jones's style i agree yes. i love it too yeah it's nice and it, it it's good like he for it's for somebody being on a bike, you know, he makes it it's not tiring because it's like you're you're there with him. I mean, like half of that story, I think, is him on this bike. So, yeah, he does a really good job of keeping you engaged through all of that. Um, so, yeah, that was that was good. Did we all read? What was it? Softly? Enter Enter softly. softly. Yeah, I, I have. I haven't read it, but I, I want to hear your thoughts on it. I'm definitely going to read it at some point. I have been both. I, I read the companion uh, novella to Almost Truth, and I've started the one for The Dark Side of the Room. But, I yeah, l- let me hear your thoughts. Yeah, I liked it. It's almost a little bit more depressing. Um, than, I'd say it is more depressing than Criterion. Yeah, and it's like uh, what's... And it's funny because I was waiting, trying to figure out how this was going to tie in. Because base the basic concept is where, gosh, what was I can't think of the main character's name. Um, Lisa. Lisa, she's a nurse. I think she's divorced, or she's gonna she's, get divorced. She's going through a divorce. Yes. So, and, and her it, husband wants custody of the kids. Yeah. Of, seeing it, um, the burned body that was Tyler's father. She has been, I think she's either relapsed or has begun taking drugs and is now yeah. addicted to fentanyl. So she, yeah, because I think she was a bit of an alcoholic and that, yeah, that that's kind of the, the, was the, the crux of what this story is without spoiling what happens. And so you're kind of following her as this nurse dealing with some really bad news that she got personal bad news between her husband and the child and also seeing that burnt body, which I didn't realize that was the dad, but that totally makes sense. Yeah, it was the dad. And um, she's like falling into drugs really hard. And yeah. we kind of see as her life spirals out of control. There's no bicycle like there is for Tyler, but there is the gray house. Yes, which... It's awesome because you got the whole criterium you hear about this gray house, but you never actually see inside. So you don't know what's happening there. And this one, you still don't know what's happening there, but you definitely get a bigger view of what's happening. I kind of see it as, um, has anyone here ever read Horns by Joe Hill? No, I haven't read it, but I've seen the movie. (laughs) So Joe Hill has these things, one of his books. I forget what he calls them. I think they might be thinnings or they might be something else, but they're like special supernatural spots in the world that connect us to like an outside world. And in horns, it's a treehouse. Oh yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I remember that. Nosferatu. It's the, um, the tunnels. Oh, it's the tunnels. And it's also the car. Yeah. 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 As driving. So, like, each Joe Hill story has something that connects our world to, like, this other alternate realm. And I kind of saw this house as being something like that. Especially because I know Tyler Jones is a huge Joe Hill fan. So yeah. I am, like, probably referencing Joe Hill in some sort of artistic way. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I can definitely see that. I just kept thinking of, and this is... uh. Uh, might be a bit of an obscure reference, but there was a show on Nickelodeon called Are You Afraid of the Dark, which I know they mm-hmm. kind of redid. But okay. back in the 90s, yeah. and there was one episode where uh, this ba- uh, there was a room in the basement and like this kid, as long as he kept giving it people, he would get whatever he wanted. So I kept thinking about that for this house. That, see, that, that actually, <laughs> to like go off on a tangent with that one, that one freaked me out because there's a part where it's like this boy, like this teenage boy, and you know, he's kind of all like teenage 90s boy, and he's in this basement, and the door opens up, and this giant like porcelain doll comes out, and that scared the crap out of me. And then, like, trying logically, I'm like, why would they? 
<laughs> why would this spirit bring a doll to this boy? But anyway, it was absolutely horrifying. And I had to like leave the basement as I was watching it because I was like, I can't deal with giant porcelain dolls. <laughs> but I anyway, I know, I know that feeling. Yep. It sucks. <laughs> so so um, I kind of thought about that while I was reading this. I honestly really enjoyed Enter Softly. I think Criterium was better, but I think Enter Softly was a really great like companion piece. Yeah. Criterium. Yeah, I think so. I think it's uh, it's tricky because I haven't read any of his other little companion ones to know because like it was nice. I don't know. Again, I really liked the story. I think Criterium was better. I don't know if this was needed. It didn't further that story along. I mean, I guess it gave us the view inside the house, but it didn't like give us a little bit more. Yeah, I don't think it was trying to give us more. I just think it was like, do you mind if we spoiled it, Lemay? Yeah, 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 it's fine. So like, you know how in Criterium, by the end, Zach is able to avoid the house and he overcomes his addictions? Mm -hmm. This is the opposite. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. The nurse gets to the house. She goes inside. She sees her addiction there and she dies. And then it ends, well, she overdoses and dies. And then the ending of the story is the old man who is talking about the house in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. He's tired of this house. And he's tired of the police doing nothing. And he's just tired of it all. So he he goes inside to, like, I think burn it down. Yep. Or find a way to destroy it. And when he gets inside, he sees a table. And he walks up to the table and he sees his choice of addiction is on the table. And it's something that nobody has known besides his wife. Yeah. And we don't know the choice that he makes at the end, but we know he makes a choice. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which, like, again, spoiling for Criterium, it gives you, like, it is the opposite because at the end of that one, you know, you see Zach and the old man sitting down and they're talking and you like the old man's really happy for Zach and is like, you can do this. And then you get to this ending for this one. And, you know, he like Rich said, he's tired. So he grabs a gas can and he's got his lighter. He, and at first you're kind of wondering, like, well, because he's talking about smoking and his wife didn't like him smoking, but he was still doing it even now. So you're kind of like, well, it's not that addiction. But at the same time, you are kind of like, oh, crap, what's on that table? And did he do it? <laughs> yeah, you you don't know. Like, Tyler, okay, okay. What's on the table? He doesn't tell us what the decision, um, is. He leaves that up to us to like imagine, which I think makes it more effective, personally. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, um, totally. But I also think that it makes it so we have a nice bookend to Criterium, whereas mm -hmm. Criterium shows the overcome of addiction. We have these other two stories that show like how addiction can be fatal or how even if you've shaken your addiction for such a long time, it lingers and it's there. Yeah. And it's always going to be there. And, and like, so I think like that makes a good bookend to thematically what he was yeah, doing. Right. Plot wise, that's right. It doesn't really do much to advance the Grey House story that much, but I think thematically it works together really well. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's like, and so that, yeah, I guess I think that's it, just... I, Yeah, I think he probably wanted to do like um, a different side of the coin kind of thing. That Yeah, which makes sense. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, because it definitely is. What you're seeing in this story as opposed to Criterium is somebody who at, at this point does just straight up give in even throughout the story, like it's not just the end throughout the story. She's kind of like, I'm just, I can't do this anymore. Just one little taste and I'll be fine. And like, she even like hears a voice yeah. and everything. So yeah, it's totally a good bookend to it. And like, you know, I guess to counter my own argument, <laughs> it's like, do I need to know more? Probably not. I have a good idea. And that's all I want. It would be interesting if you wanted to explore that a little bit more and make it, like you said, like a thinning spot. And if that means something for this town, that would be a cool concept. Do I need that? Honestly, probably not. I enjoyed what he did give us. So just yeah. countered my own argument. 
<laughs> <laughs> like I would definitely recommend checking out like Criterium and Enter Softly. And yeah. if you have a Kindle, if you get the Kindle Unlimited version of Criterium, it's both books together in one. Yeah, which is I did that. And it was weird. I don't know. Do either of you have that Kindle version? I bought the Kindle version when he first released it to support him. And when I bought it, the file hadn't updated yet. So <sighs> the version on my Kindle is just the Criterium story and that's it. But if I go onto my Kindle Cloud, I have both. Okay. I Yeah. So I got the uh, I got the Entersoftly compendium, like both uh, Entersoftly and Along the Shadow and the com uh, companion novella to Almost Ruth when Tyler sent me the arc for Almost Ruth. Ah, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so I just I have the Kindle version that has both on it. And I was just wondering because mine was really weird. It, like it had it came with highlighted stuff, but nothing like when I clicked, like, I don't maybe it was my Kindle just being weird because I was like, oh, all these sentences are highlighted already. And I, I click it on them and it said like there was notes, but then there was no notes. So maybe oh. I'm just it was weird. <laughs> so I just wanted to know if it was me or if it was like the thing that they, he was doing or somebody was doing or Amazon's doing something, but Fucking maybe it's just my, it's just my Kindle. Maybe, but yeah, I mean, I definitely want to cover more Tyler Jones in the future. He has a short story collection coming out soon. Yeah, yeah. burn the plans. I want to, I want to check that out. Me too. Definitely. Um, yeah, no, like this was. Usually our podcasts are a bit funnier with more laughs. <laughs>, yeah. laughs. I think my computer lag kind of fucked things up in the beginning, so I apologize. Oh, good. Um, but no, this this is more of a serious dis discussion. It's like when we talked about the um, what was that book? The B.R. Yeager book. Yeah. Space like that. That was a sad episode. <laughs> yeah. You really can't joke about suicide epidemics, but no. <laughs> no. And that's well, I was just thinking that too. If you've made it this far, and you, you know. D get it, addiction's tough everyone deals with that you know and i you know if you're going through that i'm so sorry and hopefully you know try your best to get some help uh, mm -hmm. um however you can if you need to reach out to somebody do that um yeah. you know this book captures addiction really well and so it could be a tough one for some people or listening to this it could be a tough one for some people just uh just know we're here and we're supporting you and addiction sucks always and then so, on that downer well, note on the flip side of the coin <laughs> yes. next week we're gonna be discussing sperm jackers from hell by christine morgan oh <laughs> yeah God. that's gonna be interesting <laughs> oh yeah that <laughs> of this We'll do it uh, well, next week. Yeah. Read the reviews. I don't know if you looked. I looked at the reviews on Goodreads and Amazon for this book, and they're pretty darn hilarious. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the tagline for the book is they've come for you, you'll come for them. <laughs> I will say I am really like I haven't started it yet. I'm planning on starting it today. I am surprised that it's a <laughs> not to be dirty, but a long book um, because I was like, how much can you get out of this concept? I guess we'll find out. But as of right now, fresh virgin eyes on sperm jackers from hell. I'm surprised it is as long as it is. I mean, Christine Morgan's a really good writer. Like, Trish, a, yeah, is a 300 page book. Yeah. And wow. I have I picked up another one of hers, yeah. something about like uh like I don't know, people in a blizzard or something. I have to look at it. A uh, white like, death? Yes. The one that Bloodshot put out. I have that too. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, I picked that up. It looked like fun. So I'm excited yeah. to do it because I don't know. I think I might have read some Christine Morgan, but I'm excited to get into it. I so might as well be sperm jackers from hell. Christine Morgan is there's two sides of her. There's like the side where she's kind of more serious and is trying to write like historical based horror stories that are like not super ridiculous. And then there's the other half of her where she's influenced by Edward Lee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sperm Jackers from Hell is obviously the Edward Lee side. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but that'll be our discussion next week, which I'm really looking forward to. But perfect for Valentine's Day. A perfect Valentine's Day. Yep. But, um, 
Vitlame, where can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, they can get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm uh, My handle is Vitlame S with a tech capital S. And I'm also on BookTube in uh, Fanged Pipsqueak Reads. Perfect. And Matt? I am on Twitter at BrandenburgDM. And you can follow me on Twitter at Rudy53088. And be sure to give our podcast a follow with at Into Staring. If you're listening, be sure to drop us some reviews as well. They always help out our podcast and the algorithm. And this is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring. <laughs> <laughs>